Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Thanks so much for coming out. Uh, it's great to be here. And if you love wine, this is the place to be because this is the, the greatest time in history for wine lovers. Um, I'm Eric Asimov. I write about wine for the New York Times. This is Eric Wareheim, yeah. and you may know him from his showbiz life, but he is also a winemaker That's and a, a bon vivant. Yeah. And um, he's going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, his wines. Um, what yeah. is the label? Uh, I, I make a, a wine uh, called Las Harris Wines. Uh, we do it in Sonoma, California, but we take fruit from Oregon and even down in Santa Barbara. And there's there is some in New York. Maybe some, has anyone had it, Las Harris? Oh yeah, look at that. Yes, we were trying to have our bubbles here, but something happened and we couldn't do it. But it's okay. They were all sold out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Happy to be here. Thanks so um, our, our focus is sparkling wines today. And as I said, this is the greatest time in history if you love wine. And one of the reasons for that is that grapes and wines, types of wines that were formerly despised and dismissed, we realize can actually be really good. And the reason is that in my opinion, there's no such thing as a bad wine or a bad grape, a bad type of wine. There is only bad winemaking and bad farming. And we've learned if you farm grapes conscientiously, you put them in the right spot, doesn't matter if they're, they're Pinot Noir or what was formerly regarded as the lowliest sort of grape, you can make great wine out of it if you do it carefully and conscientiously. And we've seen this all over the world. Wines from, from Sicily, for example, or, or different parts of Spain and, and France and, and Italy. Um, Aligoté from Burgundy is a perfect example. These are wines that, that were scorned and dismissed as not being capable of, of having much depth or, or giving much pleasure. And now, they're, they're some of the most prized wines around. Uh, Aligoté, in fact, used to be like this cheap white wine that you would put creme de cassis in to make a cure because it was thought not to be good for anything else. Now it's getting super expensive because farmers are putting it in the right place Winemakers are, are treating it with love and care, and you're making great wine. So the same thing is true with sparkling wines. <clears throat> there were uh, sorts of, of, of sparkling wines. First of all, you make any place that makes wine, makes a sparkling wine. So you find them all over the world in different styles, made with different sorts of grapes, um, by different methods. and. We have three examples today, Champagne, Cava, and Zecht. Now two of these, uh, German Zecht, German sparkling wine, and Cava, I mean, these were the kinds of wines that, that you only drank if you couldn't afford something better. Um, I remember in college, the big black Fresune bottle and we just used to call that hangover in a glass because you knew the next day you would you'd feel like shit. Um, but you drank it anyway. Um, but the same sort of renaissance that has come to other forms of wine has come to sparkling wine. And um, I guess we may as well start drinking, yeah. right? Let's get into it. Um, Let's look at the Cava first. Uh, so Cava is the sparkling wine of Spain. It's made in, in vast quantities and um, mostly in the Catalan region in the Northeast, in the Penedes. And as I said, most of that wine is, is cheap and kind of indifferent and um, it's just not very good. But the potential for Cava is great. 
because of all this sparkling wines around the world, it's the only one that's required to be made using the champagne method. And uh, by that, I mean you make a still wine, harvest the grapes, make the wine, put it in bottles, add a little bit of something sweet and something either yeast or a little bit of, of um, fermenting wine and seal it. And that second fermentation in the bottle takes place and when you ferment grape juice, yeast consumes the, the sugar in the grape juice or the sweetness there and as a byproduct creates carbon dioxide. With a sealed bottle, the carbon dioxide has nowhere to go, so it creates carbonation. And it's a uh, laborious method, and that's why a lot of, of um, inexpensive sparkling wines like Prosecco, for example, are not made that way. They're made just in, in huge tanks, and um, it's a much uh, different and cheaper method. But there's a reason for doing it, because it, it tends to make better wine. Now, the, the, the amount of bad kava in the world demonstrates that just using the champagne method doesn't guarantee good wine. But if you do it carefully with good grapes, um, you can make very good wine. So there's a set of producers in the kava area who've decided that they don't they want to break away. They don't want to be identified with this bad, cheap wine. So they don't even call their wine cava anymore. And this uh, producer, Ravento Yves Blanc, is a uh, example of that. Um, I don't think there's a longer name for wine. Ravento Yves Blanc, Conque del Rio, Anoia de Nit. Don't ask me what it all means. But Conca de Noia, uh, Conca del Rio, Rio Anoia is what they call their wine instead of cava. And uh, they farm organically or bi biodynamically. And um, they use the indigenous grapes of the area, uh, Zarello, Peralada, and Macabio, um, Macabo, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, with a little bit of monastrel, a red grape, otherwise known in French as Morved, to add a little bit of color. And if you drink it, you find that it's actually, it's super delicate. It's a little bit um, almost lacy in texture. It's not at all harsh, like, um, some of the most inexpensive cabas, and it's just it's just fresh and lovely. Yeah. I and, love this wine and very dry, which is something usually not associated with the other cabas. In my, in some of my opinion, when you're you have one glass of it, and you're like, ah, I gotta go to bed. It's just like uh, <laughs> overwhelming. This this kind of has this, this thirst quenching kind of acidity that you want to keep going back, which is kind of what you want to do with bubbles, in my opinion. And it's funny with um, rosé, I don't know if you make any rosé sparkling wines, but it's really, um, it's tough to make a well-balanced rosé. Yeah. Sometimes you, it gets a little bit of tannin yeah. in it, which you don't want in a sparkling wine. Um, yeah, we just use a, a small amount of the red juice for, for color, but yeah. in fact, like it's an important thing to give it a, a little color, but not too much texture or uh, bitterness or anything. And you can see this is like, if, if somebody didn't tell me this was a rosé, I might not know, but as you look at it, you can sense just a little bit of a salmon-y color to it. Yeah, um, it's really pretty. Sometimes with rosé sparkling wines, it actually can taste very fruity, and you get a hint of that yeah. here. but. But even more, it's the, um, it's just the, the texture, the freshness, the liveliness, the uh, uh, life in the glass that I find really attractive. Yeah. 
it's I mean honestly I don't I haven't had a <laughs> something from this region that's blown my mind like this. I think it's very good. Yeah. It's really nice. Um the best thing about it is that it's still fairly inexpensive. You can get this for roughly twenty dollars. Um that's which I crazy. I just think is a great deal. That I mean, especially for that traditional method is a, is a is a hard process versus like the Charmant method where you have these big tanks. It's, you know, when I when we at Last Harvest when we started making sparkling wine, I was like my partner Joel, the winemaker. I was like, what's the big deal? You you make some wine, you get the soda stream going, you do that over and over, and he's like, shut up. That's not. <laughs> um, you know, to do it right is there's so much care to to, to making the style. Um, and so many variables that can go wrong, especially when things are fer re fermenting in the bottle, and you know. So it's like, for twenty bucks, this is <laughs> this is like really nice, it's amazing. What do you guys think? Like it? Oh yeah, yeah. He's ready for thirds. Yeah, yeah. I also think this is it's, it's such a good food wine too. It's you know it. it it has a little depth and complexity to it that I want to eat some shelf. You know, um, I traveled in the Cava region in, in Catalonia, and it's, it's the strangest thing because um, when you go to the good producers, they want to show you the vineyards because this is historically something nobody cared about in yeah. Cava. They didn't, you know, they might have even gotten their grapes from, you know, the, the vast desert in the middle of Spain or something yeah. you know but um, they always want to take you to the vineyard and so you tend to walk up hills and, and through the vines and there at the rise there was always a table there was uh, they bring out a ham um, a pan con tomat oh. which is basically you know based the tomato ripe tomatoes squeezed on a piece of really good bread with Garlic and olive oh. oil, and uh, I'm getting excited. almonds, olives, <laughs> and then they'd serve the kava there in the vineyard. And of course, you know when you pair it with food like that, it just kind of explodes. It's so nice, yeah. it's so delicious. Yeah, it's a little fat, a little acidity, and I, I also, I mean, the idea of like looking at the vineyards for a lot of these places, they don't want you to see the vineyards. They want to, right? They don't want to know where they're sourcing it from, but overall like what you said good wine comes from good fruit and and good farming and that's like a, a such a big thing and it is an ex expensive thing for a lot of people you know so uh, again to find this one that's at a reasonable price it's really that's like revolutionary it's like a and you know a lot of people will say like why would i spend twenty dollars on a kava when i can i can get that that big black bottle for eight dollars yeah. or whatever yeah. and you know, there's there's a difference because um, it, it's not cheap to farm organically or, or biodynamically. Um, although it's so much better for the wine and it's better for the environment, and um, in a lot of ways, it's better for people's health because yeah. you're not you don't have trace residue of pesticides and yeah. you know carcinogens in the wine. Yeah, I mean, you you read that article about Roundup. Yes. So it's, doing to us, it's a very scary thing. It's just like going to, when you go to the grocery store. If you can afford it, you go for the organic fruit. I mean, it's like to me, it's, it's, I try try to tell my friends that are don't really care about natural wine or low intervention wine. It's like just think about it like that. Would you pick an apple that's a dollar twenty five or or a regular conventional apple for a dollar? Like you just spend the extra twenty five cents and have something that's good for you, and, and the taste is like profoundly better. Sometimes it's a little bit more expensive than a, a quarter, but um, you know. but I, I think that's the best way. If you want to drink better wine in your life, think of wine as food, yeah. and all the care that you may put into shopping for ingredients for for produce or, or meat or whatever. Um, think about wine that way too, because. Yeah. As you say, so many people, they'll go to the farmer's market and, and pick out these, um, you know, wonderful or, organic produce and then go buy Trader Joe's for two buck chuck. Yeah. And, you know, it's a completely different thing. Yes. That's not okay. 
I'm out of it. <laughs> I'm not one to judge. I mean, wine isn't a priority in everybody's life, but <laughs> if it is, you know, you want to you want to drink better. Yeah. I mean, take my mom for example. She's like she only she only takes her fruits from her garden. She's a great gardener and a cook. And she stopped drinking wine because of her migraines. You get lots right. of migraines. And I started turning her on to these kinds of wines, even Las Harvest wines. And now she, she can party. She parties and she doesn't get those migraines. I'm like, there you go. My small I, contribution to my mom's I life. I will say, <laughs> despite um, uh, a lot of natural wine propaganda, you still will get a hangover yeah. if you drink too much. Uh, alcohol it's the alcohol, poison. not the additives. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's go on to the, uh, the next wine, which is the, uh, the Zet, S-E-K-T. I'm very excited about this one. And a lot of people say, what does Zet mean? And, um, you know, theoretically it means German sparkling wine, but in reality it meant bad, mediocre, harsh, <laughs> acidic German sparkling wine, yeah. which is for, for years what you would find. And I, I never drank Zet because I never found a good one. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because, you know, Germany, where, where they grow grapes in Germany, has always been a kind of a marginal growing area, by which I mean it's every year it's a challenge to, to ripen the grapes. Yeah. And so now we've entered the era of climate change and the challenge is to not over-ripen grapes. And, you know, we tend to think of climate change and all of the, the real and, and potentially catastrophic problems that it's causing for the world. Oh, yeah. Um, but, it, but it actually has, as far as wine goes, has had moments of, of, of being beneficial. And one of the things it's done in Germany is make it easier to ripen grapes. So in, what they used to do is take the grapes that they couldn't ripen sufficiently to make a still wine out of and make sparkling wine because, you know, it, who cares about sparkling? Yeah. I mean, that was their attitude. But, um, but now they can ripen the grapes well. And, and more to the point, winemakers are, are being much more um, in, intentional, to use a faddish word, about their yeah. their sparkling wine making. So Von Winning, for example, this is a, um, a very old estate in the, the Pfalz region in, in Germany, and it was bought as new ownership as of, I think, around 15 years ago. And the guys, who, the people who own it now are just very serious and have a vision of making great wine, and that extends to, to their Zet. So they're using uh, ripe grapes, they're using uh, the champagne method to make the wines, although they're not required to. And uh, just as in Kaba, there's a uh, kind of a rebirth going on of, of German Zet. And in, you know, how do you, how do you know who makes good Zet? It, generally, if they're if they are making good Riesling or good wines of other sorts, their sparkling wine will be good too. Yeah. I, <clears throat> it's interesting, uh, I was just in Germany, in that region, I was drinking all the Riesling and wines like this, and I feel like there is this renaissance or like revolution of, Germans have always been, whatever's popular or will, will make money, they'll, those styles of wines that they'll make. Yeah. They're, they're very like, in touch with the market or, or what they like. But now I think they're thinking beyond that and making wines like this and making a lot of red wine too and sparkling red, red wine. wine. And yeah. it's, it's a really interesting time for, for these amazing producers to kind of just think differently and try new things and kind of break these rules and uh, rediscover themselves, which is like what I think was happening here. So how, how would you describe the difference between this wine and the Kaba? I mean, this has, you know, much more acidity. I think it's like a more mineralic, you know, these, the vineyards in Germany are these steep, beautiful, rocky, I mean, it's more in the Mosul, not, not right. as false, but um, I, I just taste 
I just taste these crushed rocks and a little bit more of the lemon versus a little bit more um, uh, uh, slightly more fruity in that one. But um, I love it. It's it's richer too. I mean, yeah. the um, if the kava was lacy and, mm -hmm. and almost delicate, this is fuller bodied and, and uh, kind of creamy and yeah. toasty. It's not heavy, but it's it just has that that richness. Yeah. Was, and this, I, was I, this aged in oak versus? Well, that's exactly the point. Um, Sorry to no. steal your punchline. No. <laughs> I, I actually didn't know. <laughs> it just shows that you're following along. I'm listening. <laughs> I'm listening to the master. <laughs> um, yeah, so the kava gets aged in um, tanks before it gets re-fermented in the bottle. And this, re which is, this is entirely Riesling, and a portion of it is aged in tanks, but I think there's also a portion that's aged in oak barrels. And, you know, that's, um, you see people doing that in Champagne, it's very rare to age Riesling in barrels. And, and in, um, in Germany, these guys have been kind of revolutionary in doing that. For better or worse, I don't always, I don't particularly like oaky wines, but if it's well integrated and um, you know oak, oak barrels are not just for adding flavor, they're also for adding texture because of the yeah. the the air that sort of microscopically goes through the pores. Yeah. Um, so you're making barrel aged sparkling wine, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it's 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 so we we pick kind of. Um, early and to balance some of that like mega acidity because we yeah. don't want it to be too fruity we kind of soften it with we tried those different vessels and large format uh wood is the way to go for, for what we do so, yeah. so this um you know un unlike the zets of old there's nothing harsh or overly yeah. acidic about it it's all um beautifully balanced yeah. And this too is not, um, it's a little bit more expensive than the Kava. It's probably closer to $30 than 20. Mm -hmm. But um, it also has a really distinctive personality. And, um, you know, I mentioned that sparkling wines are made all over the world. And a lot of people think of anything that's less expensive than a champagne or any other kind of sparkling wine as just a champagne substitute. You know, yeah. we can just do this and we can do it, we can have champagne, but it's, we'll do this and it's cheaper. Yeah. Um, and I'm kind of fighting against that idea because all of these wines have their own distinct personality and um, they deserve just to be, to be appreciated for their own um, attributes rather than to thought of as just a cheaper alternative. Yeah. It's also fun to, if you're having dinner with some more traditional wine friends, to pour something like this, like, here's some champagne. And they'll all be like, wow, this is awesome. And you're like, it's Riesling, you know, like, not to, you know, not to, uh, There's nothing better than friends. a gotcha with yeah, a I traditional know. wine person. <laughs> They're like, oh, thanks. <laughs> I was just coming over for dinner, and now you're making fun of me? Um, uh, but my point is that I, I just I totally agree with you. These can be looked at as celebratory wines. They could be looked at as getting the meal wine. I take this to the beach, and uh, you know when there's a beach, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a nice thing. And it does, doesn't really slow you down as some, some of the other ones do, I think. And you know that's a, a, another thing about sparkling wine. Um, so often people reserve it for celebrations or you know art openings or christening a ship or whatever <laughs> or a child uh, or a child <laughs> but I mean, it's such a good food wine and um, you know it's great to just serve or drink at a meal yeah um, we we do this thing if we're doing a big meal yeah like a, we do this thing called a sparkling reset where it's you know you're you start in the beginning and then after you've had a couple reds, you go to a bottle of sparkling and it kind of cleanses your palate, gets you excited, the bubbles give you energy, and you go for another chicken parm or whatever. 
I never thought of that. Yeah, it's, That's it's a great revolutionary. Idea. <laughs> That's only if you're going to be drinking, like we do, many bottles, um, you know, a lot of bottles. So it's, it's, it's all about how to get that extra chicken parm at the end of the night. <laughs> or that extra bottle of red. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, let's move on to the third glass. Um, this is a, a, a champagne, and um, despite everything that I said about all the other sparkling wines of the world, um, they all look at champagne as the, the benchmark, and, and there's good reason for that, because really champagne is, is unsurpassed in terms of, of elegance and complexity and uh, uh, beauty and profundity sometimes, um, but Champagne too has had a, a renaissance like these areas. Um, if you, most of you are too young to remember Champagne 20 or 25 years ago, but that was a time when you only spoke of Champagne in terms of the, the house style. You know, one, one Champagne house made it in a, in, in, in a certain way, a delicate way, another one made it in a fuller bodied way, and they would repeat uh, an aim for consistency yeah. year after year, and there was, it was considered different than other wines in the world. If you talk about Burgundy, you talk about the terroir, and where, where do the grapes come from, and how does it reflect that, that place, Nobody talked about vineyards or terroir in Champagne. It was all the, the art of the cellar master and the blend in, yeah. you know? It was divorced from, um, from agriculture and the land. Yeah. And in the last 20 years, you had a rise of, of what we generally call grower producers. Instead of, these were small farmers who probably at one point or another sold their grapes to these big houses, but for whatever reason started to make champagne on their own. And these tended to be much more um, distinctive because the grapes came from one place, they weren't blends from the entire uh, geography of champagne. Um, they were not, you know, stirred by the, the master blender, but just made into wine and, and sold as wine. And these um, became enormously attractive over the last um, 20 years to the point where restaurants in New York might only have a list of grower champagnes and you wouldn't see any of the, um, the big houses, yeah. which I kind of re resented because a lot of these big houses made great champagnes and it's wrong to sort of ignore them just because you're, has, you're enjoying the farmer yeah. champagnes. Um, but a lot of the houses recognized what was happening, recognized that they had been complacent and started to really up their game by um, paying more attention to the agriculture, more attention to the winemaking. And a, and a prime example is Louis Roederer, um, which Many people know makes uh, Cristal. That's their their you know highest end champagne. But their Brut Premier was their their entry level um, non vintage, and uh, that was always very good. But they didn't they weren't complacent about it. And just a couple of years ago, they completely changed the way they made this wine. Instead of making a, a non-vintage, or as the champagne people like to say, multi-vintage, in which you're, you're blending a bunch of different vintages and looking to create complexity that way, they created um, something a, a little bit different. And if you can imagine, if you have a, a, a vat of wine, and each year you draw a little bit from that vat to make a champagne, and you replace what you drew out with a with the new vintage. So if you start with one vintage, the next year you're adding a second vintage, and the following year a third, and over time, you're adding more and more different vintages to this blend. It's the way they make sherry. And this method in the last 
10 years or so, it started with a, a grower uh, producer, um, Jacques Selos, but it has been adopted all over Champagne, and Rotorer is maybe the biggest house to use that method for making their very basic Champagne. And this is the first example of that, that that they released. It's called 242, and that means it's the 242nd blended champagne that they've made since the inception of the house, I don't know, how many centuries ago? Yeah, and many. What, what do you, how do you like this? Did I, you drink I it? I love it. I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it's wild that a house, like a you know, popular brand or a house is is doing this. My my first wine trip to uh, I was telling you last night um, to Epernay to Champagne region. I visited the Dom cellars, and it was interesting that you know the the cellars were amazing and seeing that how they riddle the bottles to kind of mix the yeast around and how how sacred that was. And I was like, when can we see the vineyards? And they're like, that's not part of the tour. <laughs> like they don't like it's what you said. It's really everything in the cellar, the cellar masters. That's the magic. Not only is it not part of part of the tour, they don't want you to know where the yes, it was the grapes very come secretive, from. and they have this pride about themselves. Like we do it our way, and we're never going to change. You know, and it's almost like a. It felt to me like a pasteurization thing. You know, like it's homogenized. Every year it's going to be the same, even though they are doing blending and stuff. It it just is. It's kind of very interesting that. They're going to the style that, which is what I drink too, um, which is just more unique and special, and focusing on the, the growers. And th this is not to demean Dom Perignon because that's a that's a great, great one, champagne, yeah. but it's it's just different. And, and one thing to know about Louis Roederer, um, they've quietly over time uh, accumulated a lot of their own vineyards. And I think. Oh, it, this is the only wine which is not an entirely state-produced, a state-produced wine. They still have to buy some grapes to make their um, their blend, I guess. Yeah. But uh, all of their own vine vineyards are farmed biodynamically, and that's something that you never would have heard in Champagne. Never. They're eager to take you to the vineyard yeah. now and, and show you yeah. where everything comes from. And that's another thing that you never would have seen before. Um, and I, I love this champagne. Yeah. I, I think it's it's rich, it's it's complex, it's uh, you know, it's creamy, it's like creamy like the the Riesling, but it's got a little bit more um, going on. Yeah. Do they, it. Does, do they still have to abide by the rules of how many years it needs to be in bottle before it's released to be champagne? I think there's a minimal rule, but I'm sure that Rotorer would go well beyond mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it has great complexity, but it, it doesn't have that kind of bri overly brioche quality that some of the more aged No, and, and you probably find that, you know, if you took this bottle, which costs around $65, and you just stuck it somewhere for 10 years, it would develop yeah. that quality. Yeah. Um, and you can do that. People say, you know, they, the reflex idea is that non-vintage champagne is just for drinking right away, but good examples will really um, evolve with age. Yeah. Whether you prefer it that way is another question. Yeah. But, but that's the exciting part about sparkles, bubbles, and champagne is there's so many styles now that are, are kind of accepted, like solo style, like kind of more oxidative styles that are, at least I'm seeing more, you know, out in the market and restaurants. It's fun to try the whole spectrum. Yeah, it's, um, there's, it, it, Champagne went from a very staid region to one that's wildly exciting. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, climate change they're not immune from uh, climate change, so a lot of uh, champagne producers, or, or, or a small number of them, I should say, are buying land in England now, um, which also has wow. now a thriving, sparkling wine uh, production, and it's it's quite good, although it's pretty different from, yeah. from champagne. We just have to wait 10 years until it's warm enough. <laughs> 
it's scary. I worked harvest in California this year, and in the vineyards it was 120 degrees. We were talking about this, and literally the leaves were brown. They just the, and the vines shut down within a week. It's very scary. And then then we had to make decisions like you pick now and not get full ripeness, or you take the chance and it's going to rain and dilute the fruit. So it's it's a real issue that everyone's kind of looking north. I mean, you guys are good up here with your Finger Lakes and all that stuff. Nice, cooler climate, but let's not get let's, let's not get bummed out right now. Sorry, <laughs> we can go down that route. This is about uh, fun. Well, um, so tell tell me a little more about the sparkling. How many different wines do you make? We have we have a lot of cuvées. I think we're at like thirteen right now, but we. We, it's, it's fun to work with, we only work with organic vineyards in California and Oregon, and and at first we were picking all kinds of stuff, Trousseau Gris, we're trying Albarino now, um, we love cooler climate stuff, we're going to Oregon get Pinot Noir, so we're kind of finding our, our footing, we've been, we have seven vintages, but we've always made our um, sparkling Carignan, because Carignan is, in Mendocino, there's a lot of organic Carignan vineyards, and not many people look at Carignan as a fine wine grape, it's more of a blending grape, but we wanted to kind of change that. It's part of like our ethos is like, you get good fruit, and you have good, good winemaking, and clean wine making and natural winemaking, you could have a delicate, beautiful product that I think stands up to a lot of other sparkling wines, so that's been like one of our flagship wines for a while. But it, it is, it's, it's expensive, it's like $42, because it, it takes so so much, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to do, and at a small level, you know, we're a small winery, so, but it, it's one of my favorite wines. And, and do you make that with the champagne method? Or? Yes, we, it's like the champ. we call it like method untraditional, <laughs> it's like <laughs> only because at the very end we don't add any dosage. Right. We don't, you know, we just kind of uh, remove the leaves and then fill the bottles with more of the sparkling wine and then that's it. So it's it's a very dry wine, very in line with with um, with these today, but it's, it's uh, pretty elegant. And we're kind of holding them back because we want the wine to develop a little bit more character like this, a little bit more richness and that kind of slight brioche vibe. We all love champagne, so that's, that's what we're doing. Which, uh, by the way, I'm using the term champagne method, but if you tried to put that on a bottle, you would be sued, mostly, because yeah. um, champagne is a, is a geographical term that's reserved for champagne, except for uh, several grandfathered in um, companies that continue to use it in the U.S. Yeah. Um, so you would see what is the what is it method traditional the method untraditional your method <laughs> untraditional well uh, but you would use if you made it that way in the U.S. you would use method traditional yeah. method or, yeah yeah it's yeah. sort of like I just read the story on the two buck chuck guy and he la had a label on his wine it was like Napa wine or something like that but I think it was like Napa style wine yeah. and he picked his fruit from like the shit worlds of the Central Valley, you know, and, but it's, it's very interesting that the, the, the copyright law and like the name champagne and the, the method, and people are very, it's, it's tradition, you know, I think it's kind of cool. Well, um, I'm not sure what time it is, because I'm having fun. Yes, me too, it's uh, 1.45. Oh, so we've pretty much uh, come to the end of our stint here. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Yeah. But now's the time, because after ne after this we're drinking. Yes. Yes. There's, her question is, who do we look for? Like Las Haras, who do you look for for inspiration? And if you like Las Haras, who else should you be buying? Right? In, California. In California. Well, there's no one like us here. <laughs> <laughs> No, there's lots of, um, we look for inspiration. When I first met Joel, my partner, I was just doing comedy, and he was like, he was like, who are you? You, you, you can't make wine, you're, you're a comedian, get out of here. But he sent me on a journey through Europe, and I, I visited lots of regions that, I, like the Jura, and meeting cool producers that are doing things a little differently, and we took a lot of that 
information and made um, made wine in California in those styles. So we've, our our inspiration is is France and Italy really and Germany now. But um, so there's but there's lots of awesome like Martha Stallman is one of our good friends. We actually made a, a collaboration wine with her and they're available. She's here. great. Yeah. Um, She's just the real thing. She leans a little bit more on the natural side, you know, like there's some of those ex expressions in her wine, which most people really love. Um, and who else in um, California? That um, This guy, um, Michael Cruz, makes a sparkling. Do you know this one, Ultramarine? Um, well, Ultramarine is the super expensive one that nobody can buy but yeah um, but, he has a, a but he but he also has his less expensive wines that are very good cruise yeah. wine company c-r-u-s-e yeah. he's he's in line with lots of, i mean our our thing is we love very linear wines really crisp mineral not flabby and exhaustive wine so it's like he's on that same level of super bright poppy stuff let me ask you do you make a, a chardonnay we just we just did. Uh, we we have some from Alder Springs in Mendocino and some from um, Sanford and Benedict in Santa Barbara, and it's exciting. Yeah, it's um, it's but we, we and you we, don't make an oaky buttery style. No, we don't. We don't make Papa's blend. <laughs> we don't. Like, um, no, we we like literally study from Burgundy. Like we actually got Lafon's pressing program this year. Lafon's a great white burgundy producer, and you, the slightly reductive style that gives you this like insane nose. Um, so we press the grapes really delicately like he does. We, we pick a little bit um, under ripe, uh, a, a lower bricks count than many California winemakers. So we're trying to get, and using more neutral barrels versus uh, new oak. So it's tasting good. It tastes really yeah. good. And so this is, uh, my point because a lot of people I find have completely you either love that old oaky buttery stuff or you say all California Chardonnay is made that way and therefore I don't like California Chardonnay yeah. and it's not true the great thing now is that there's a complete diversity of, of expressions and all the things that we thought we knew we don't actually yeah. know and that's that's true for cava Zec and champagne, everything is evolving. And if you have like very fixed opinions because you had a bottle once and decided you didn't like it, it's a, it's a good time to revisit yeah. all of these things. It is, it's a great time. One. Any other questions? How did I get into it? Um, I. How did I get into winemaking? I moved, I, I'm from Philly and I moved, and I used to drink Rafino when I was watching The Sopranos. That was my, that was my wine experience. Uh, when Tony popped the Rafino when he was making that, that baked CD on Sunday, I drank the Rafino. And then I'd have big red lips and like a headache. No, um, then I moved to Los Angeles and a couple friends, actor friends, and I, we would go out to eat and we, tr we pretended to be fancy and we're like, we'll get a wine, we'll do the wine pairing. And then we realized instantly how wine and food is a, such an important thing. Then I did a couple Europe trips and it just like blew my mind that wine was not, it wasn't this luxury item, it was like actually a, a means of life, especially in Italy, like you drink wine every day. For, and, and it was so, so profound, like I came back and got into it heavily and I met my partner and we just, I dove in and now I'm obsessed and I don't care about comedy and I just want <laughs> fried chicken and champagne and that's it. <laughs> but it's a similar, and I think it's like making comedy or any kind of video work, it's the same feeling as giving someone wine, it's like this joyous thing. If you pour someone a glass of wine, they're gonna be happy if it's good wine. Same with making someone laugh, so I feel like it's very intertwined in my perspective. Any other questions? Yeah. Ooh. Good question. Um, well, I love drinking any good restaurant, um, by my standards, to be good, you also have to have a good wine selection. And I don't mean like hundreds of different bottles, 
just well-chosen bottles that are going to go with whatever the, um, the vibe of the place is. And I think, you know, in New York now, there's so many great places. I mean, it's almost like every, every neighborhood, bistro, yeah. um, yeah. is kind of wine-oriented. At least before the pandemic, they all had a sommelier and... and um, you know, now we all know that that you can't hire people anymore yeah. in, in restaurants, so everybody's short-staffed. But there, I, I don't mean to be vague, but there's so many great places, it's hard to single out one or two. Yeah, I mean, off the top of my head, uh, Servos in Chinatown, if you want Spanish seafood, they have Spanish wines, and a lot of them are low intervention, natural size, and it just works, you know. Uh, there's a, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great place and, yeah. and a great call. There's a new place I was telling you about this, um, Claude C L A U D, that opened fairly recently in the East Village. Great food, wonderful wine list, and it just everything works there. Yeah, um, it's just very. Cool. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just look at my Instagram. Yeah. All, all the. All the all the secrets are there. All the secrets are n no longer secrets, but... Uh. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank um, you. If, uh, if you want to continue drinking, there's a bar right in the middle of area where they're, they're offering some really good wines, um, including the cava we drank yeah. here. So you can uh, try those out and enjoy the food and the festival. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.